Well, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Yang very much for inviting me to this meeting. It's uh, you know, all sorts of very interesting talks and uh, maybe some collaborations will come out of this. Um, well, as you probably realise, my uh, title, The End of an Era, is uh, a bit of a joke because Americans pronounce era as error. <laughs> so it may well be the end of an era, uh, of an era as well. Um, uh, in fact, um, well, I, I uh, will begin by uh, my next slide. Um, Divine Newland, um, in the first talk uh, this morning, mentioned this, um, that there is a physics is a certain problems. Um, uh, well, let me just relate this to the question of time and change, because physics is about describing change or how things um, change from one time to another, so you can make predictions. Uh, Newton started it all with predictions of, most of the um, motions of planets, and then that theory was extended more and more, so we got to the um, so-called standard model, which, uh, very nice theory, it, um, as, um, as people found more and more particles, they uh, wanted to put them all in, and uh, standard model did this, but with just a little um, problem, as you heard about this morning, that you can't fit gravity into it. Um, so uh, what can we do about that? Well, there are two approaches. What people have tried is what I describe as business as usual. Um, you, uh, you apply the same techniques. You uh, do things like add extra dimensions. Uh, the, um, it seemed you needed to have at least uh, 10 or 11 dimensions to fit gravity in and stop the theory blowing up. Um, and then uh, a few tweaks, supersymmetry, and so on. Um, uh, now, the problem with that is that it then stopped being physics. It more or less became uh, nice, pure mathematics. The usual, usual connection with the real world um, was rather lost. Um, there are very few, uh, well, the predictions that <coughs> this theory does make um, haven't yet been uh, confirmed by experiment, the so-called super particles, they've not been found at all. Um, and uh, uh, and um, then uh, phenomena have been discovered which you then have to uh, fix some theory by hastily changing the theory. So it's not, not the nice kind of physics that one had uh, with a standard model. Uh, and the alternative would be radical change, and that's what I'm talking about in, in my, my lecture today. Um, so, um, what is this change? Well, um, one way of describing it is um, a new kind of order in science. So, uh, maybe not in, entirely new, but um, different from, from what we're familiar with. Uh, and uh, can describe this as triadic organization, um, and I'll explain in a minute, um, rather than usual dyadic. Now, uh, I'm going to draw a diagram to explain that. Uh, one kind of organization we're familiar with, and again, um, my job has been done this morning as one of the lecturers talked about ordering in magnets. Um, a magnet like um, iron uh, uh, is made out of lots of little magnets. And these interact, and they tend to become parallel with each other. And if the temperature isn't too high, uh, so there's not too much agitation, then you will get this ordering spreading out over a large um, distance. Now, this triadic organization is something rather more subtle than that. So subtle that it's not too clear how, um, how one can handle it. But there is nevertheless uh, very good evidence that some different kind of organization is present. Uh, <clears throat> and this isn't really new because the, ph the philosopher um, Charles Sanders Peirce, back in the 19th century, um, more or less talked about this kind of ordering. He talked about firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Um, and, uh, uh, well, the way where three comes in is uh, where the relationship between two entities is influenced by a third. So, um, but before I want get on to that, I'd just like to mention uh, one factor which is um, 
uh, important, in which I mentioned in, uh, um, after, after one of the lectures and the comments, um, because uh, something wh where, which, where there's a lot of argument about its um, uh, relevance is uh, the phenomenon of observation. Um, and observation is something which gets into quantum mechanics very early on. As it turns out, if you want to, um, uh, well, it's a very funny kind of theory, quantum mechanics. Um, it, it doesn't so much tell you what the world is, so perhaps it does that. But in order to interpret it, you have to interpret it in terms of observation. And there's a, um, a simple equation. Um, uh, let me try the other one. Um, ah, right. Uh, now pressing the right button, yes. Um, this simple equation um, where A represents what you're measuring, that's uh, capital A, little a represents um, the result of a measurement, and there's this equation, oh, psi is the wave function of a state of a system. This equation tells you, uh, um, relates the uh, measurement to the physics. Um, it says that the, um, it says that something called collapse occurs. The state of a system does this mathematical thing, collapsing um, to a special um, state, an eigenvalue. Um, the point, all, all you need to know about that equation is that it, it appears to say that observing the system changes it. And, um, well, you, you might say that's not um, very surprising. Uh, you'd expect um, your measurement instrument will interfere with it. But um, the important thing is that the um, change it makes depends on what you observe. Um, you observe one thing and you, it changes another. Um, and uh, the physicist John Archibald Wheeler, um, he wrote a very interesting um, article called Law Without Law, where he said this is... Um, uh, very crucial if you do lots of observations um, then these may dramatically change the physics and uh, even went as far as saying that this um, observation process might create everything from nothing but he didn't really uh, go into detail as to how, how it would work it was just an, an idea and a proposal um, okay well um, one where one might go beyond that is to say, let's not uh, talk about observation, the dry kind of measurement that the physicist makes. Let's talk about um, uh, observation in real life. And we observe in real life to get some results. Our observation is functional. We look at the traffic because uh, we want to be able to cross the road safely. Um, so that's a rather intricate kind of process. and that kind of observation is something different. So it, you might expect that if you uh, thought of that kind of observation, that might have novel implications. Uh, okay, so uh, with that in mind, let, let me get back to thirdness. Um, as I said a little while back, uh, thirdness means um, one entity is working on the relationship between two others. Um, and this could alternatively be cause, called um, integration, um, or getting two things to work together. And that is important because that's what happens when you develop. You're, you start off being uncoordinated. Um, you, uh, your, your stepping and your balancing don't work together when you walk. But as time <coughs> goes on, you get things coordinated better um, until you have a, a, a single... Um, well-functioning process. So you can see, uh, as far as development goes, um, that is um, an important thing. Um, but um, it turns out that you um, have to make changes in a systematic manner. You have to know the significance of what's happening when you lose balance so you know what to do about it. So this is um, a systematic process, and you uh, develop, you do your integration um, by using feedback. And uh, this is basically what happens as you uh, develop, get older, get all sorts of capacities. You're just um, uh, trying to put various systems together and uh, 
learning how to put things together properly, and there's a cumulative integration process. Um, a student of mine, um, the original George Osborne, actually, no, no uh, relation as far as I know, he, he actually did a, um, uh, a computer simulation of this, which you can find um, on my web pages if you look at the publication link. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't take it any further than a, uh, a simple um, um, <coughs> simulation of how balance started. But um, anyway, that, that seems to be what happens, seems to be important. Um, now, uh, do I need... Um, OK, let me just say that this um, feedback is used in two ways. Um, you're uh, using feedback all the time when you're... When you're doing things, but this is a special kind of feedback which is responsible for development. Um, okay, so, uh, well, my, my thesis is that this um, process I've just described underlies all of developments. Um, you have lots of components, and these components um, look after each other, see how they're performing, and this uh, um, and be responsible for all of um, development, everything, uh, if you um, got things to um, the right kind of model, that, that would explain it all. Uh, an important feature of this would be a kind of selection process. Um, you'd have to have as part of this process that the things which didn't do very well got eliminated. So you get better and better processes and come to some kind of equilibrium. So this is the kind of... Uh, a uh, new kind of order or organization um, that uh, I'm proposing is behind all of this. And I was very interested in Julian's talk um, this morning because um, he seems to be finding this sort of thing in his simulations. Uh, there's, I can see a lot of parallels, and maybe if you looked under the surface there, you would see the kind of cognitive developments that I'm talking about. Um, Okay, so this is a new kind of spontaneous organization that we're um, I'm proposing. But you might say, well, uh, what, why, should we, why should we believe any of this? It's just hand-waving. Well, I think there's a very good argument for saying... Um, well, actually, no, before I go into this, let me say that um, this line of research was stimulated by um, a second person I mentioned earlier on. There's um, Charles Sanders Pierce um, talked about something very similar. Um, his uh, thirdness uh, did various things like um, relating signs and what signs refer to their objects. And he, he said uh, there seems to be some other process which he called the um, in interpretant or other system that he called the interpretant which would connect the two. So you would need that third element. Um, now uh, Alexa Yardley is somebody who contacted me um, a few years ago with her ideas, and uh, my assessment at this stage is that she had some intuitive picture of how all this would work. But uh, in view of its subtleties, um, uh, she had problems explaining it, and uh, her method, I think, um, one would have to say, is like the Zen koan. She would make some mysterious statement, like every line is the um, diameter of a circle, which one was left to understand the meaning of. Uh, eventually, I understood that the um, line refers to um, two systems which have a, uh, a link. They exchange information, and becoming a circle is turning into a unit. And so the connection between the two is the process I talked about earlier. And um, so there's uh, lots of systematics there. Uh, she has a book called Circular Theory um, explaining it all. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's how this developed and uh, may not have realized it without these um, strange coins which were presented to me. Okay, um, now, okay, as I said, uh, you might think, well, this, um, it's all very well to say things build up in this way. Um, but something which shows that this really does happen is the phenomenon of language. Now, language, um, when you think about it, is a very peculiar phenomenon because... Um, we learn a language, I'm using English now. This is uh, an elaborate language. It has uh, a large vocabulary, but it also has um, a grammar. Without the grammar, um, things would be very uh, confused. Um, 
as we know, when uh, you uh, misinterpret something. There, the grammar wasn't quite doing its job, but grammar is playing a subtle role in connecting words with meaning. Um, and this uh, mysteriously comes into existence. There was a time when the English language didn't exist, or any language. And then, over time, uh, people uh, made some kind of sounds, and they gradually understood each other, and language built up step by step. So you see it's um, the same kind of thing um, as uh, uh, same kind of mechanism I'm talking about and has these amazing consequences. Um, of course, you may argue as to whether it really, that's really all that's needed. Um, one uh, argument which uh, you may or may not... Uh, just a minute. Oh, I'm going to go into this slide to um, make my point. Um, this is an amazingly complicated thing, and as we all know, complicated things uh, tend to break down. Uh, language doesn't, and uh, probably the reason why language works so well is that at its basis it's really very simple. Um, there's a simple mechanism that you, um, you're putting parts together and seeing how well this works. Um, if there's anything more complicated than that, um, language would probably um, just not um, work very well. Well, you may or may not uh, like that argument, but um, I think it will turn out that that's basically what's involved in language. Um, and uh, uh, a way you might like to um, think about this is... Um, um, this is uh, a bit like solving a jigsaw puzzle. It's like um, we have a collection of parts we can use and uh, you're putting the parts together, you, you uh, put them together to see how they work, and uh, the experienced jigsaw puzzler knows, has clues which um, assist putting together parts um, correctly. Um, they, they assist the uh, search, which is what I'm suggesting is a part of this um, o um, o um, ordering process. Okay. Um, but there's one difference um, which may be the crucial thing which makes the uh, turns the dyadic into the triadic in that we're, t we're talking about processes over time and that um, seems to make things much more elaborate. Um, and uh, <coughs> we can sort of see what, um, how this works. Um, I'm giving the example of rock climbing. Now rock climbing is something where you have to fit two things together. Your... Um, nervous system is doing some computation to compute what you should do and unless what you uh, compute fits the reality, in other words, unless the uh, mental and physical fit together, um, then you will be prob have problems. So what, what's going on is that you, you do simple problems first and then you, you find out what mechanism is needed to coordinate them then go into more complicated uh, rock climbing problems and you uh, you add another bit of system to that, and uh, some fairly advanced tricks are produced in this way, uh, complex systems, you can use these to solve similar problems and so on. So that's um, this uh, fitting together, uh, getting more and more elaborate parts, is what um, the proposal is, is what's involved. Um, okay. Well, now, um, <clears throat> to get on to the more dramatic part of my proposals, um, uh, I've only told you about one part of language so far, because um, <clears throat> uh, every child is born with some sp mechanisms specialised to language, uh, the so-called language ac acquisition devices. Um, and these are the things which... Um, know what to look for, as it were. So, how do these come into existence? Uh, the answer is you've got two time scales. You could say there are um, language system users and there's language system evolution. Uh, individual language speakers develop over a comparatively short time scale, um, uh, number of years, whereas the language system probably developed over a much longer period. Uh, 
and the way the users develop, they assess how well the system that they have is working for them in their communications and uh, thereby develop their systems. Whereas um, system development essentially assesses how well the system works for uh, users in general. I'm talking about probably the um, uh, ordinary um, e evolution by natural selection. Um, originally, the language system started off as something very simple. Then some mutation improved it, so you got a better system. There was selection in favor of that better system. And then from that, you could build on a still better system. Uh, there's a book by Jakendorf, um, uh, uh, let's see, um, yeah, what it's called on language, which um, sort of explains language in these terms. Um, okay, so let me um, sketch this in a diagram. Uh, <coughs> here are the uh, two time scales. As far as language is concerned, the individual has a short time scale, and the species develops uh, a system which individuals use. So a sort of flow from the system, from the, from the species. The individual is informed by what the species have. And the species are developing, and the individuals are making use of that development. OK, well, I'm going to take that general theme and see where it takes us. And uh, I want to talk about mathematics. Because mathematics presents an interesting puzzle, uh, just as language does. Um, Penrose has talked about this quite a bit. Um, now let me just say uh, what, language, what mathematics is in terms of the kind of scheme I've talked about. Um, it's really, uh, well, language plays a part of it but, it, on it, but it's a special kind of language, um, specialized kind of language. It comes about through what you could call cumulative reflection on patterns. Uh, you first see a pattern and you invent a description that describes it. Then you find that there are patterns in that world of description, and so you describe those patterns, and so it goes. Uh, a simple illustration of this is uh, numbers. Um, uh, numbers 1, 2, 3, and so on represent the pattern that there are uh, single objects, pairs of objects, and so on, and it's useful to produce a language which distinguishes between having one of something, two of something, and so on. Um, it's also useful to invent um, the uh, plus. Uh, you put two things together with two things and you get four, so plus comes out naturally there. Well, then you find there's a pattern, uh, various patterns, like a, a well, a, a, in terms of algebraic notation, x plus y equals y plus x. So that's saying a, a pattern in the language that you've developed to describe patterns. That gets you from arithmetic to algebra. So there's a special cumulative um, process um, which, uh, in, a, in essence, gives you mathematics. Well, now there's a puzzle, and this is the kind of puzzle to which Penrose drew attention. You could say there's an observational side or experimental side to mathematics and an insightful side. Um, now, I talk about observation um, uh, as a kind which was popular in schools, the time when my daughter was in school. I don't know if it's still like that. You, um, uh, you find out about mathematics by, uh, by seeing, well, by doing research into numbers. And uh, uh, I suppose finding out that uh, 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 2 might be something like that. Anyway, there's um, some mathematical facts you find out by um, just seeing what they apply. It's just like uh, scientists doing experiments. But it's also mathematical insight, and that's the peculiar thing, that math mathematicians have a kind of feel for what is right and, and, and not, and this guides them towards um, uh, developing mathematics. You may feel that you've got a new result, and then you, you play around to see if you can prove it. And um, the question is, where does this come from? Uh, in fact, it's not clear that we evolved to be able to do mathematics. Mathematics doesn't help us in ordinary life, even though uh, in modern technology it does. So where did it come from? Well, we can uh, take something like the model I um, looked before. 
and suggest that um, just as uh, we had species evolution um, to develop uh, a system which individuals could use, we have another system of some kind uh, which we can call the platonic realm and in, some individuals can tune into that realm um, which is unlikely to have come about through natural selection because as I said, well, um, clearly natural selection can explain why our language systems get better and better but doesn't explain why we get better and better at uh, mathematical insight so this platonic realm may be something different uh, now um, uh, and this may be relevant to physics as um, we'll see in the next diagram uh, anyway the idea is that this is some aspect of the physical universe which has existed for a very long time and has been uh, longer than our universe so there's a much greater time scale um, which um, I guess is indicated by this um, diagram here um, which has been able to uh, acquire mathematics and also to get rather good at, um, at its experimental mathematics it, it says it knows more about um, whether a given theorem is true or not so it's unclear exactly how it would work well, uh, it's an argument for the, uh, this platonic realm but then it might, uh, if this thing can be good at mathematics it can also have learnt to do other things and uh, it may have also learnt to do universes so uh, a picture more or less, um, let me sketch this out um, Um, there's a sort of um, well-confirmed physics where we have um, our theories fit the experiment nicely and there's this uh, questionable area that I talked about at the beginning so the proposal is that this questionable area isn't just um, business as usual it's more the um, kind of thing I've been talking about it has this complicated organisation and this is the source of uh, this confirmed physics um, these uh, possibly higher entities have, um, have a different kind of reality to us and they play at making universes and so on um, and uh, we have some contact with us through mathematical insight and perhaps through inspiration of other kinds and they maybe uh, directing our, our ordinary universe um, ok, uh, let me just, uh, well I'm going to say this is a taboo subject because it uh, sounds a bit like intelligent design uh, but before I go on to that um, political aspect um, I'd uh, like to give another illustration um, it's actually the first Tucson uh, consciousness conference um, 20 years ago I've been collaborating with a musician. I, um, I was a musicologist. I uh, asked, uh, said, Is it funny? Well, in fact, my consciousness had just been getting to the point where music seemed meaningful to me and not just interesting sounds. And I asked what uh, musicians thought about this. And she referred to me, me to the um, uh, book by Suzanne Langer, uh, Philosophy in a New Key, which is all about two kinds of symbols. The, symbols that uh, scientists use which denote things and symbols which are for our minds and they have connotations so um, then uh, I started thinking about this and wondered what, um, what you might derive from this the puzzle then is why particular patterns have these special effects and uh, neither she nor I were very convinced by what um, uh, people had written about this uh, trying to explain it um, this sort of something springs on you unexpectedly or something that's what good music is which hardly seems to explain why you have to have it just right um, well uh, this is a paper you can see on my web pages again if you follow the publications link and then to music uh, now I have some note about it um, uh, 
Well, uh, one, one thing you can say when you analyze what's going on is that there are certain fertile patterns. There's evidence for this if you look at the kind of things musicians write. One, one composer may use the ideas of another. They, they seem to be recyclable. So you have to show the, um, why there are these fertile patterns which can be used to create music. Um, so uh, you say they are, um, uh, well, some adaptive mechanism, some me mechanism which supports life and perhaps supports thought. But anyway, it's something happening in the mind. The question is, which mind are these patterns fertile for? And we discarded the uh, traditional explanations that they are um, for the individual minds. And the reason is for discarding that is that it, um, they are, um, it isn't just one person that um, finds a, a pattern um, powerful. Uh, the same pattern works for many people. So it's something beyond the individual that's working there. You might think it's cultural. Well, a lot of music is cultural, but that wouldn't explain why somebody can suddenly come up with a new kind of music which gets accepted by a culture. So that obviously has not come from a culture because it was invented. So we said this um, could come from some more universal mind and uh, platonic mind. So there seems to be a certain amount of evidence that there is um, uh, this questionable thing actually involves um, something more mind-like than just a simple piece of mathematics which couldn't do anything fancy. Uh, now, uh, Julian Barber's talk this morning encourages me to think that you can um, uh, actually work with this because he's found similar things uh, coming out of computer simulations. Of course, you could try the same with language, but his models, which um, assume only systems interacting under gravity show that various interesting things happen. And it, it's quite likely that when you looked into the details, you would find um, structures forming. Well, he mentioned structures forming. And you may very well find that they conform with this thirdness idea. So this is um, uh, another direction from which they um, have been discovered. It's also a curious thing which has uh, been discovered by people working in computation, quantum mechanics recently, something called quantum discord, which I think is misnamed. I think it should be called quantum harmony. But that, I don't, haven't uh, uh, studied it in detail, but um, uh, what I do know about it is that it's something that goes beyond quantum entanglement, which is a mysterious connection between two systems. It's something which is, works on a much broader scale and is more stable, and that may also be connected with this thirdness. Um, Okay, so, uh, and uh, one of our group, um, Alex Hankey, has been uh, looking into what one may, how one may be able to connect it with physics, um, things like chaos and so on, how, how that would um, enter into this kind of picture. Okay, well now the um, political thing, this is a taboo subject. People have had their academic careers terminated for promoting ideas similar to these I've been talking about. There's a uh, YouTube video about this called um, uh, uh, Not Forbidden, um, No Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Uh, it's somewhat extreme because um, uh, uh, it's uh, compared to Hitler, which perhaps is a bit extreme. But anyway, it uh, shows what's happened to people who've uh, started saying, uh, well, there may be something too intelligent design. Um, okay. But anyway, uh, this is... Um, a sort of more uh, scientific um, approach in the, in the spirit of physics. Um, uh, started off by saying there's this um, apparent uh, kind of organization which is, goes beyond what I call dyadic organization, what you get in ferromagnets. And um, there's, uh, it appears that language um, operates according to this kind of Principle. So it's an illustration of these principles at work. Uh, there are some computer simulations which may, um, such as those you've heard earlier today, which may also uh, provide a basis for it. Um, so in other words, it is uh, not um, completely crazy. It's, it's uh, in the tradition of um, 
uh, theoretical physics, one might say. Also, interestingly, it has connections with Eastern philosophy. So I think uh, much effort ought to be put into seeing what we have there. I'll just finish by thanking uh, some of my collaborators. Alex Hankey has been working on connections with um, quantum mechanics, well, with conventional physics and how things like uh, critical phenomena may um, come into this. Uh, uh, for example, critical phenomena tend to produce simple mathematics. Um, Madame Thangavelu, who's an um, uh, expert in Indian philosophy, and tells us, oh, it's really this, and there's some uh, strange things he's uh, mentioned, um, some strange mechanisms which we may eventually be able to connect. And Plamen Semyonov, um, he, uh, some time ago, he contacted me in regard to a project he's been developing. Um, his argument is that uh, a lot of the ideas we have at the moment um, don't really work for biology, so can we produce uh, me uh, a kind of mathematics that's more suitable for biology? And there have been various um, conferences on this, and there's uh, a white paper. Um, actually, if you look, um, search on that word in Biosa, you'll find the white paper, which is uh, all, all the ideas that people have produced on how you might make a new kind of mathematics suitable for biology. And uh, I'd also like to thank you for listening, so thank you very much. Thank you.